Thank you very much to Lorenzo and also Daniela that is not here for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here uh, to present my work on the dynamization of rapid wave growth. I'm Gisela Alfano uh, and I'm a researcher at the Assos University in Belgium. And the presentation of today is part of uh, an European project that is called STOP. It's an Horizon 2020. Uh, and stop acronym means science and technology on childhood obesity policy. Uh, the project is led by Franco Sassi at Imperial College, and Assert University is one of the partners. And of course, this analysis was made also with the collaboration of Unitor. The first time that I approached the problem of obesity, I was very surprised to discover that obesity was actually named as a disease only in 2000 from WHO. And there are certain institutions, such as the American Medical Institution, that defined obesity as a proper disease only in 2015, 10 years ago. Today, the most widely accepted definition of obesity is that it's a non-communicable disease defined by an excess of adiposity that can impair health. Of course, at the population level, we cannot measure adiposity fat mass for everybody. Therefore, we use BMI uh, as like a proxy uh, through which we define topics. BMI, so your age over your uh, square, uh, your weight over your square weight. And how we define obesity if the BMI is superior than the 30. But why we are talking about obesity? Because at the public health level, obesity is really important. You have to think that in 2019, 5 million deaths were caused by high BMI. And you can see in the picture, the, this is an estimate from the um, GDP, and you can see that high body mass index is the fifth cause of mortality in female. It's just above the battle to, to give you an idea of what is the risk of obesity. And for male, uh, it occupies the sixth position. And you can see it on top there are the females and on the bottom there are males. But why the foreign stock we are focusing on China? If it is a problem of value. The reason that there are certain reasons, and the first reason I would say is that it's very well known that if you do an intervention on some people that are obese, or, or on people that are at high risk of becoming obese, you can achieve a very limited benefit. And this is the slide that most of you perhaps know. Uh, it's about, like, originally was used by a paper of um, Gottfried and Lukman, uh, and show on the x-axis that when we age, we increase our risk of non-communicable disease, including obesity in this paper then, was adapted to metabolic disease. And it's the upper line. And if you do a late intervention, you can decrease this risk to the dotted line. But you can see that the differential is really small. However, if you do the intervention channel, the difference, so the dotted line, can be much bigger. And it's even larger if you do the intervention during pregnancy or in, in the infant life. And therefore, this is why we focus on childhood. The second reason is that we normally think, okay, the baby is obese, but what's the problem with it? Actually, already in childhood, obesity is really a big problem. The first reason is that if you're a obese as a child, you have the chances of being obese also in your adult life that is five times more than a baby that is not obese. And the second thing is also that 
the consequences of obesity are already very challenging. Apart from social stigma, also babies that are obese or children that are obese, they are more likely to have asthma, chronic fatty liver disease, kidney disease, musculoskeletal complication, diabetes, and even cancer. And then there is a third reason why we're looking at obesity. The reason is that obesity in childhood is really prevalent. In the picture here, you can see, can you see the, yes, uh, you can see that in Europe, in 2016, we had the prevalence of obesity in children and adolescents between 5 and 19 years of 10%. It is huge. And when we think about childhood obesity, we are prone to think about it as a, a disease that is a disease of the modern era. No? However, obesity has always been existing. In the figure, for example, you can see the dance of the of Willendorf. It is a statue that is in the National History Museum and it was built in 30,000 before Christ. This statue testified that obesity was very present in the historic area, although perhaps was something so great to be considered something divine, to be impressed in a stage. And for more than 30,000 years, the prevalence of obesity perhaps stayed always so great. It was always so rare. What we saw it's an increase in obesity. Here we only show the obesity of the children, but thus it is the same for adults, that the prevalence of obesity only increased a lot during the last 40 years. And it passed from 2% to 10% in only 40 years. And if there is an doctor between you, some of you may think, okay, that might be mine, is strongly inherited from my parents. BMI is an inherited trait, 40 and 70 percent. However, what we see in this slide, the growth in this curve of the prevalence, cannot be explained by an evolutionary change in our genome. It cannot happen in 40 years. Therefore, what causes childhood obesity? It should be something else. And if it is not our gene, this means that it's our environment. And for obesity, and in particular for childhood obesity, we need the environmental, let's say, factors that determine childhood obesity are really well known. What is also well known is that different factors act at different life stages in life. If you think about childhood obesity or obesity more in general, of course, what is causing the obesity? It's an impairment between the intake of calories and the expenditure. Huh? This is something everybody knows. But we want to look at the underlying determinants huh? that are absolutely. And when we look at them, what we know is that, for example, that if you have a lower uh, socioeconomical position, you have a higher risk of being obese as the adult. However, there are critical life stage, for example, in utero life or childhood, in which if certain factor acts, they may really trigger and increase our risk of disease. And this is also a very famous picture. This uh, was first. Uh, presented by the WHO in relation to for explaining the life goals determinant of the uh, disease and this line adapted uh, to obesity. You can see the bottom line is the increase of the risk of obesity with age, while the upper line is increase of risk of obesity when certain factors max. But which are these factors? For example, during the neutral life, the maternal BMI, the fact that your mother smokes or not, the weight she gained during the pregnancy, 
a socioeconomical position, and if she has gestational diabetes, they will influence uh, the, the, the chances of a baby of being obese or not. But also, the, the first years of life are also important. For example, the birth rate is a very important determinant for childhood obesity. Growth rate, the child care attendance, the antibiotics, how many hours your baby sleep, uh, and uh, of course, the children nutrition, and in particular, breastfeeding. But how this determinant acts? How then, like if I smoke, uh, my child will have higher chances of being obese. Actually, today I'm sure that most of you are uh, familiar with the concept of the X. We believe that all this external exposure, the X is something that we refer to everything that is non genetic, basically, um, interact with our genes. But how it does to our internal exosome? But what is this internal exosome? Actually, it's to the biological layer that made up our body. Basically, it's our DNA, our RNA, our proteins, and our metabolites. In this presentation, I will focus only on one layer, that is the DNA methylation. What is DNA methylation? It's the adding of a methyl group to a cytosine that is linked to a one, a so called CTG, because the link is made of a phosphate. It's the most epigenetic mechanism, the, the, the epigenetic mechanism that is studied the most. And what we mean by epigenetics? It's a methodic, inevitable change that is able to change our gene expression without changing the gene sequence. How methylation can change our gene expression? Basically, the adding of the methyl group changes the structure of the DNA methylation, and this makes a change into the translation on, of our genes. But also, we are very interested in the DNA methylation, in particular when we think about obesity, because I told you before, there are life stages that are very important, and for example, the uterus is one of these life stages, and it's actually the same for DNA methylation. What happens? Each cell of your body has a proper DNA methylation. And this may of course, also the uh, oocyte and the spermatozoa also have the DNA methylation. And in the picture, you can see when there is fertilization, you will have some DNA methylation from your mother and some from your father. However, soon after the fertilization, there is a wave of demethylation. Hmm? So there is an ADC of your of your methylation that has a different rate in mother and father uh, because the mechanisms are different and only some small genes that are imprinted escape these matches. And then this is followed by a de novo methylation. What does it mean? This is like essential for like your development. Um, but what does it mean? If, if a determinant, like if I smoke during this window that is very critical for DNA methylation, perhaps this determinant acts on the DNA methylation and there is like a change in my DNA methylation during this critical window that persists over my life course and may trigger a disease. Therefore, this made up the idea of DNA methylation being a bridge between the exposure in utero and the risk of obesity in childhood and then later in life in adulthood. And you can see in the picture that DNA methylation, particularly at birth, may be in between the exposure, the determinant of childhood obesity and childhood obesity. 
This motivated us to perform a systematic review inside the stock project. And we didn't limit it our search to work, but we searched the entire childhood and several anthropometrics, not only obesity, but also other um, obesity-related anthropometrics, BMI, waist circumference, and so on. And this is a Venn diagram. And what you can see is the genes that are uh, methylated, um, differentially methylated, with the different anthropometrics. And what this talk shows is that indeed there are certain genes that seem to be promisingly associated with anthropometrics in childhood. However, when we look better and more deeper into this study, what we discovered is that they were main, mainly candidate study. Therefore, we could not trust them 100%. And the thing that was more surprising is that the newer studies with a lot of subjects that had an, an agnostic design looked at all the genome, they were not replicating this finding. And one of these big studies presented here is start of the base a consortium so pregnancy and childhood um, uh, uh, epigenetics. Uh, it's a study based on 4,000 children, and the study looked at cord blood DNA manipulation, so DNA manipulation at birth, and the association with the child and adolescent BMI. And you can see the, the result of these studies. This is a Manhattan plot on the x-axis. There are the chromosomes, the position on the chromosome. On the y-axis, there is the p-value, and each dot represented the CTG. And you can see that there is a line that represents the genome-wide uh, significance, and nothing is about the line. There is no association. This is more association with adolescents here. And this was very surprising. I have to think that in adults, there's plenty of study that demonstrate that DNA methylation is linked to BMI. And also, the same base consortium already performed a large study of DNA methylation and birth and demonstrated association into thousands of CPGs. Why this happen? The authors speculated that perhaps it's not that the annihilation caused obesity or DMI, but perhaps it's the opposite. So it's the obesity that causes a change in the, in the DNA annihilation. Therefore, what we thought was okay, we, we still believe that the annihilation at birth is important. What perhaps, if it doesn't relate to childhood obesity, what if another early risk factor of childhood obesity is related to DNA regulation? And we thought, which is the most important determinants during infancy of childhood obesity? And the most important is rapid weight growth. In, in fact, uh, if you are a rapid grower, you have the risk of becoming obese during your childhood that is four times more than a baby that is not a rapid grower. But perhaps some of you know what is rapid growth, some are not. I, I will try to explain. This rapid weight growth, like the definition is uh, not quite simple crossing in weight growth. What does it mean? Uh, you can see in the picture the weight rate of age for girls and boys. This means that we are raising the weight, we are raising the age. And you can see that the baby on average, so if it's on the 50 percentile, if it is uh, a female, then weights at birth around 3 kilos. Then we know that the weight, of course, increases because we are growing and but this, this way grow according to this curve. Hmm? However, and this means that at one year, on average, 
this baby girl that was born with three kilos will be around eight kilos. However, there are also certain babies that are birthed with a certain weight, let's say for with two and a half kilos, so at a very low percentile, but when they age, when they are one year, they end up in a very high percentile. Eh? Perhaps they also reach eight kilos. And this is called rapid weight growth, if you are crossing several centiles. And this is not beneficial for your health over the years. Therefore, the, the research question, of course, we couldn't answer all the questions and many are possible, but in these studies, what we, what we thought, okay, let's look at DNA inflation and rapid weight growth. And more in general, what we believe is going on is that the environmental exposure are influencing your DNA inflation work. These will influence if you are a rapid grower or not and if you are a rapid grower you have more chances of becoming obese in childhood and later in obesity of course we, we are not answering all these questions but we are only looking then to dna mutilation of birth and rapid weight growth of course we were not the first one to think about it other researcher however only looked at candidate genes there was one large study that looked at um, one study that looked at uh, the entire DNA in methylon, but was in a small sample size on 80 children, and most of the studies only looked at single CTGs and not at regions. And this motivated us to perform this study, which are the population that we consider they are sick. Generation 21 in, in Portugal, ASPAC in the UK, and Bionage in Belgium. And there are Ima in Spain, equally true in Italy, and Rea in Greece, which are all part of the exosomes consortium and were analyzed with all together. Also, because the annihilation for them was never ever seen now. Then, in total, we had 2,000 babies. What we did in the core blood, we measured DNA manipulation through arrays. There were two different kinds 450k and that illumina manipulation arrays. Then, at one year, we calculated the rapid wave growth. Basically, what we did was we, we used the Z score uh, of the WHO, and they are adjusted on second stage of the weight at birth and the predicted weight at one year, and if the difference between the predicted weight at one year and birth weight was severe than 0.67 standard deviation, then it was this crossing in the percentile, we defined the baby as rapid lower. And we were also lucky because we had data available also between four and eight years from the children, and we were also able to calculate if the children were overweight or not. Then a bit of statistics. Uh, I'm sure that you are even better than me. Uh, and what we did is actually to perform um, in each core an additional wide association study. That means we look at the entire genome. Uh, and also we looked at gestational age acceleration. We use logistic mixed regression modeling with random effects on technical variables that are cheap and position. And we adjusted on all the determinants that I told you before. The determinants are the, of, of drug growth and of child obesity, meaning that we adjusted on maternal smoking, maternal education, maternal preference in BMI, her age, the parity, gestational, uh, gestational age, sex, court membership on for the exosomes, and cell proportion. Of course, we did a series of quality control that I won't show you, but trust me, they work. Um, and what we did with the result, we performed a, a fixed 
a fixed backpack meta in US. So we meta analyzed all these data, we pulled them together, and we looked at the single CPGs, but also we looked at the regions. We used two algorithms, Comba, Combat and EMR data, and only if a region was significantly involved, we considered the region insignificant. You may have noticed that we didn't have birth rate, but we performed a scientific analysis on the birth rate. Then we did some follow up analysis on our findings, and in particular, we did prediction of rapid growth by a random forest. We checked if our DNA methylation uh, signature that we find related to rapid growth were the mediator of the effect of some determinants on the rapid growth. We did some functional analysis on this CPG that we found associated to rapid growth by associating them with the entire transcriptome and the metabolome. And we also looked if these CPGs that we found related to rapid growth were also associated with childhood overweight. Why we didn't have birth weight? Somebody may have questioned me. The reason is that the measure birth weight and the animation at the same time. And therefore, you cannot be sure which one is the ancestor. And from the from the duct, the directed uh, acidic graph, you can see that perhaps birth weight is on the path that leads from the prenatal exposure to the methylation and to rapid growth rate. However, we adjusted on birth rate with sensitivity analysis to be sure. And what were our results? The first thing that we found is that in our population, there were a very high rate of rapid growers. Here you can see the different populations and the meta analysis. And on average, we had 32% babies that were rapid growers. And in Portugal, it seems that 40% of the babies are rapid growers, which was a little bit puzzling. And if we look at the characteristic of the population, you can see that we had more or less the same amount of boys and girls. The stational age was more or less 59 weeks than at third. However, in generation 21 in Portugal, in which we had a very high prevalence of rapid growers, it seems that gestational age was a bit lower, and it makes sense. If you are preterm, you have higher chances of being rapid growing. And it's the same for birth weight, more or less normal birth weight for all the cohorts. And for gestation 21, we had a slightly lower birth weight. Part was more or less the same. We did the higher rate in generation 21. And it also makes sense if you are at your first pregnancy, you have an higher risk to have a baby that is rapid growing or it's overweight or, or, or obese. And the reason is for, uh, due to a change in your hormones, but also anatomically, like your uterus will grow and plus validation will go crazy in your uterus. And this means that in the next pregnancy, the nutrition will become more available. Uh, maternal age is more or less 30, 29. Uh, we have very low prevalence of low maternal education in court like environment in Belgium. It makes sense, it's a very young court, it's from 2010, while other courts that are a bit older from the 90s have a higher prevalence of maternal education that is low, such as ASPAC. And you can see also in generation 21, 50% of the female were low educated, which is also related to rapid growth. Also for smoking, we can see the same very low prevalence in certain countries like Belgium, very high in ASPA in generation 21. And the maternal BMI was more or less or normal below 25. And then, if we looked at in each single core, which is the difference between the non rapid growers and the rapid growers, there were only two predictors that were very important and different between the two groups. 
that is the gestational age, if you have a lower gestational age, then in all the courts you have a higher risk of being rapid growers. And also, if you are at your first pregnancy, you have a higher risk of becoming and rapid weight growers. Then let's go to the result. Uh, these are the results from the meta analysis. And again, it's the same monocle plot as before. Then we have chromosome with p values. And you can see that there are these three guys above the red line that is the background significant that are significant associated with uh, rapid weighting. Then there were also 49 CPGs that are suggestive significant, meaning that their p values were below one to one. The minus five. But let's have a look to the three guys that we found associated with rapid wave growth. They were located in three genes that you can see here, and you can see they are the, the association is always positive. We couldn't see from the polar plus something that was wrong with them. Association was very consistent in all the ports. And we were very surprised by the function of these genes. For example, PCSK5 has been associated in GWAS to cholesterol in adult. Uh, RD5B instead is a, a protein that is um, involved in the adipocyte differentiation and in chaining from brown to white adipocytes which are more uh, uh, energy storing, and therefore it makes sense they are associated with rapid growth. And KLF is a, a super light factor protein, which is also involved in adipocyte differentiation by interaction with PPR gamma, which is very well known to act in obesity. And also the fact that they were already being associated with birth weight, also was something very promising for us. And also the direction with birth weight was consistent with what we found, because with birth weight, they, they find that the other people, other researchers, they find an inverse association with birth weight. And birth weight is inversely associated with rapid growth. If you have low birth weight, you have higher chances of being Rapid growth. However, when we added birth weight to our model, we lost the significance for these CPGs, meaning that perhaps birth weight is the real driver. When we look at, at regions, so multiple CPGs that are all significant together, you can see them represented here in green with the name of the gene associated. We found 16 significant differential methylated regions. And you can see the, the genes also here that are associated with, with these regions. They, there are some of them that make sense. For example, there is this uh, RDM16. These are the methylation in these genes. In this gene was found to be associated with child BMI by case. So it makes sense that we also found it here with rapid growth. However, again, when we add birth weight, we lost the significance of all these differentially methylated regions and only two stayed significant. In particular, there was one region, Aurora Kinase C, which was also significant with childhood overweight. At the epigenome Y uh, association level. And this Aurora Knasi gene is very different from what we see so far. It's not involved in adipocyte differentiation, cholesterol, or, or something related to obesity. And instead, it's something really basic. It's involved in mitosis cell cycle and has been previously associated with fetal growth. We also looked at gestational age acceleration, or we calculated it through the Boeing plot. What is gestational age acceleration? Basically, there are certain CPG that we know they can predict gestational age. 
uh, and we calculated the DNA map, DNA making gestational age to, to these CPGs, and then we use the uh, receivers from uh, the ratio between the uh, DNA gestational age and the actual chronological gestation age. And what we saw is that there is an inverse association with target weight growth. Also, I would say quite consistent, although it's mainly driven by us, but then it's not need, uh, with rapid weight growth. What does it mean if you're if you have an higher gestational age acceleration, you are at lower, you have lower chances. Of being rapid grower. And this finding at the beginning, I was a bit puzzled because if I think about um, adult age acceleration, I think about something related to mortality. If you have an higher acceleration of your inflation age, then it means that you are at a higher risk of mortality. Why? Why here we see something that is completely different? And perhaps the reason is that gestational age acceleration doesn't mean that for aging, but means something else in core blood. Something else that means development, growth. And then the, the direction of the, of the association is, is much uh, more understandable. And in fact, they found the same that Greater gestational age acceleration was associated, was associated with higher birth weight, meaning that your gestational age acceleration means rapid growth. Then we we took our finding. Of course, we had only three CPG. That then we had to increase our list of CPG at least to something that was meaningful, and therefore we went for the. 44 significant CPGs that were below the p value of 1 to the minus 5. And what we did was okay, if I take this CPG that are associated with rapid growth, how well I can predict rapid growth. And the results are shown in the drop curve here, how to interpret the drop curve. Basically, the, the, the plot showed the your probability of predicting rapid growth, if your curve is on this line, the dotted line, it means like flipping a coin. Hmm? It's by chance. But you can see when, when we use a model which includes conventional risk factors, meaning maternal education, smoking, BMI, etc., we had an, an area under the curve that was 0.67. Good, it's good. And when we added the CPGs, we could, that is the, the violet line, you can see that there is an increase, eh? it, it becomes better, although the increase in numbers is really small, we could reach also only a, an area under the curve of 0 0.7, so three points more, but still there is an increase. Then what we did was to take our findings, so our DNA manipulation sites and our regions, and we regress them against the entire class symptom and the metabolism. This is only to show, okay, I found some CPGs, what do they mean? What do they mean in terms of gene expression? And we can see that these CPGs that we found were actually related to to some gene expression, but not to the metabolism. What's here is a bit puzzling. If you look at this gene expression, they, they are mainly non-long coding RNAs. That makes sense. We know from the literature that long long coding RNAs are related to obesity and therefore can be related also to rapid growth. However, what I think is a bit weird is that the location of the CPGs and the gene expression is very far on the chromosomes. Then I'm not sure how to interpret this stuff. It's a little bit complicated. 
And then we, we went for mediation. Huh? So the purpose of this analysis is, okay, we found this guy, the CPGs, what they do? Are they really, do they really do something? Yeah? They are really in between some prenatal exposure and rapid weight growth. What we did was we took maternal age, BMI, parity, gestational age, smoking, and infection, and so on. And we, we calculated the total effect, so all these blue lines, and we distinguish the total effect in a direct effect, not mediated through the DNA mediation, and an indirect effect mediated through the DNA mediation, so the, the light blue lines. And what we found, you can see only the sound that are significant, that are about gestational age. You can see that gestational age is related with rapid growth. The odds ratio is 0 0.6, meaning an increase in your gestational age is associated with a decreased risk of rapid weight gain. And all the effect is direct. And this is the total effect, and this is the direct effect. Although for three CPGs, also there is a small but significant, if you look at the confidence interval, indirect effect that is here represented by the light. Therefore, I will go over the, the conclusion. What we found is that the causal and ventilation is associated with rapid weight growth. We could see this association that is more evident at the regions. The, the DNA mutilation signals we found improve the prediction of rapid weight growth, although the improvement was pretty little. We were able to find uh, one region, Aurora Kinesis C, that was also associated with child and overweight. This is pretty promising. Um, the translation of the result was a bit tricky, mostly non coding RNAs. And many markers were also related to birth at the tower. Then, what we would like to do next? Of course, we want to improve the interpretation of our findings. Then, if you have any idea on how to improve it, uh, we are really open to everything. Uh, we know that there are certain points that we are a bit lacking. Uh, for example, the mediation is not really multidimensional. We look at single CPGs, why we you know that there are methods that are better. Also, we didn't uh, take into account all the possible confounders, and perhaps there are other mechanisms that are really important, for example, gestational diabetes. Of course, like we tried here to answer a small question, but our plans are to even do better, for example, not only look at rapid growth in weight, but also in a uh, and perhaps if rapid growth, uh, um, rapid growth, it's not only related to childhood obesity, but also there are other outcomes that we could explore through this result. And I will end with some thanks to all our collaborators, in particular to Daniela, that today is not here, and to my supervisor, Michelle Vasquez, and uh, the Thank you very much for your attention.